So good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Sykes. I'm an attorney here in Iowa. I live in Jefferson County. And my law practice at this time is specializing in uh, legal estate planning. Not financial planning, but legal estate planning, which typically we're talking about wills, trusts, medical powers of attorney, uh, working with families to just plan uh, how to help, how to best pass their assets on to the next generation. So I wanna just give a couple thanks as we get going. I, I wanna thank Rebecca Johnson, the head librarian here for being so interested in this topic and sponsoring my lectures. The library is now my sponsor and I, I'm very pleased with that. And I also wanna thank Jason, Jason Strong from the Fairfield Media Center, who's graciously offered to film this. And for those that could not attend, the lecture will be on, available on FPAC on YouTube, and hopefully within a month or so, a copy of it will be on my website. So you could tell your friends. I'd like to mention why am I doing this? Why am I doing free public lectures on a legal topic? And it starts off with two stories. Well, actually, two, two stories that were very challenging and two stories that I feel had some grace associated with it in terms of people's lives. I, I've been doing legal estate planning as part of my practice, at least going back five or six years, but in the last two years, it's become the predominant part of my practice. And I've probably done locally about 100 family estates. So that's a lot of people and a lot of families and different circumstances, everybody's a little different. And so um, it's an area I find very satisfying because it's helping people. Now, as I, t as I talk to you, I want you to understand that at this time, the legal estate planning, in my mind, is going through a paradigm change. In other words, the way it used to be for hundreds of years is now changing, and we're in the middle of that change. And what that looks like, and I'm, I'm going to give you a simple example, is that when you're in the middle of a paradigm, you don't know it, and you tend to cling to the old ways. It's just been that way forever. It's not gonna change. Why should I change? Why should I do it a different way? A very, I, I think a very telling example, um, Let's go back to 1900, and people were riding horses. And that's how, it, and carriages, and you know, everything was pulled by a horse. And these newfangled cars came out. Well, you remember the stories. People would say, oh, this is never gonna last. Horses are reliable. Uh, the automobile industry is just, it's a fluke. Well, that's a paradigm change. When that first happened, people really wanted to keep the old way. And over time, of course, as we know, the automobile was here to stay. But right at that interim point, there is a change. And that's what's happening right now in the legal profession. In the legal profession, and for most people, just just by living, going to school, talking to people, most people, if you ask, would say, if I have a will, I've done my job. I have a will, and, and some people don't even have a will, because let's be honest about it, this is not the topic that people look forward to doing. It's like buying life insurance and doing wills. It's a, it's a sign that we're not kids anymore but it is also part of adult responsibility, particularly if we have children, loved ones, family. Um, there's a sense of, of wanting to take care of them and address these issues properly. So where does this come into my lecture? Well, I'm going to tell you two initial stories. And these are people that were close to me, so this is one of the reasons why, if not the main reason why, I decided this needed to be done. 
one family called me and the husband in the family had passed away and the family did have a will. In the second story, a, 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 a husband passed away and the family did not have a will. So we have the will and no will. And in both cases, these people knew me and the, the, the wives and the, the kids called me after the event, after the person had passed. Now the family with the will said to me, David, and you have to imagine the, the context of them calling me at the middle of that very sensitive time. And I knew them and it, you know, we've all been there with loss and they call me and they go, David, I just found out that my husband, you know, we had a will, but they're telling me we have to go to probate court. And I, I didn't know anything about probate court. And I, I wanted to be able to sell the house or access accounts that were in my husband's name. And it turns out I can't do it. I can't, I'm not allowed to do that without going through probate court and getting ultimately a judge's signed approval on a, on a probate order. And the family had no idea what, what this was, that they have to go hire a lawyer, they, they can't access funds, they're dealing with a funeral, and suddenly they're finding out about a six to 12 month legal probate process that would take place in the Jefferson County Courthouse. And that has been the way it's been for, say at least the last 100 years. That's just the way it is. And it does get the job done. It does, and everybody involved is, are doing good work. But it's expensive, it's stressful, it's in court, it's public. You have to contact creditors, you have to file reports with the court, the court has to approve it. Um, it takes time. And the fees are dictated by statute. The attorneys that are involved in probate can get up to 2.2% .2 of the gross value of the estate. So if you have a $100,000 estate, which I don't mean 100,000 in cash, I mean 100,000 with your home, your car, your savings, your retirement account, gross it up. And if it's $100,000 and the, the legal fee is at least $2,200, plus filing fees, plus publication fees to creditors, and this often used term of extraordinary legal fees when things out of the ordinary come up and the lawyers petition the court for additional fees. It's not uncommon. So if you have a half a million dollar estate, now we're looking at over $11,000 and change. And so suddenly you have to realize that when somebody passes, they may not have that kind of liquid money. It's tied up. It's in investment money. It's in, it's in a it's in the house, it's in illiquid assets. It's not like you can just write a check. And that's a time when you do have to write some checks. So this lady, this friend asked me, what can I do? And I said, sadly, it's too late. The will will have to go to probate and you'll have to go through the process. Just steal yourself and it will, it will work itself out. And that's what they had to do. And it was very difficult because of, you can imagine the circumstances. The second story, the second story was the, uh, the gentleman had no will. And the family called me. And what happens in that situation? Well, believe it or not, they have to go to probate. But instead of having a will that the deceased loved one, you know, put their attention on, there is an Iowa statute that dictates what the will will be. It's, a, it's the legislature's attempt to create at least something. So they created a statutory will that is imposed upon the estate in an attempt to at least try to do the right thing, which may or may not be what the deceased loved one intended. Their family situation, could be a little different than what the statute is addressing, and it's better than nothing. But it's a long way from ideal. So I dealt with both those situations, 
and I realized, why, why are people not talking about this? You know, I know about it, but so in my conversations with people, very few people knew about this. The people that tended to know about it were friends that were wealthy. They somehow, it, it must be a boys club or a girls club where if you're wealthy, somehow this information gets to you. Because the family had money for a long time, so the lawyers would always do it for the wealthy. And you'd hear about it. The Kennedys had these trusts and other families. And, and it was seen, it, the, the common rule of thumb was it was for wealthy people, complicated wealthy people, situations. It's not true. In today's world, a simple estate with a will and a trust can be very inexpensive. It can be less expensive than probate, a whole lot less stressful, and you plan it and you understand it at a time when it's very easy to understand. So that's the paradigm shift. People are not aware of what I just said. And some of you, I'm looking at your faces, you're looking at me like, really? Yeah, this is exactly how it works. Other lawyers, accountants, financial planners, insurance professionals, for whatever reason, have not been ringing this bell. And some of you may be hearing this for the first time and going, I didn't know that. Now the two good stories, if you call them good, or better situations were friends that I did do the estates years ago, and in both cases, the husband passed, and the wives and the children who were friends of mine, and I care about them, in addition to the grieving process, all the finances were taken care of. It, it didn't bring the loved one back, but instead of going to probate court and dealing with all of that stress, we had already done the whole program, the whole package. So everything passed automatically without the need of lawyers or courts or finances. It was already done. And that's why I'm here today. I feel as an attorney that specializes in this area, that my job in the community is to let you know what the truth of the matter is, to educate you. And when you leave here today, you're going to have a basic understanding that is, is much more sophisticated than most people have. It's just the way it is. In a few more years, I think like the car and the horses, it'll start to become more common knowledge. Now, I will say early on that even given um, the fact that you would save money by doing this, it's still not inexpensive. And so what I have done is I have discounted my standard fees up to 70% based on the size of one's estate. So if you have a multi-million dollar estate, I charge my normal fees. If you have estates, let's say, under $400,000, my fee is $750 for that one person, which is my commitment that people don't end up in probate at a time when it's the most inconvenient. And so that's my commitment, and I, I just want to be upfront about that. So that's the paradigm change. That's the, the, the picture we're talking about probate and wills, or how we do it the other way. And why is it so simple, really, at least for, you know, for a lawyer? Now wills, as I mentioned, everybody knows about wills. They're older than time in Europe. Before there was in America, there were wills. There are all kinds of wills. You've seen cowboy movies where the guy is, is, is gasping and he's saying on a piece of paper, I leave my horse, my gun, and my saddle to my buddy Tex, and he marks an X. Guess what? In Texas, back in the 1800s, that worked. And we've all seen that on some type of TV show. Modern day wills are, are a little a bit different. You need to have certain what they call testamentary requirements, which is a, a fancy legal word for saying you've got to say some things and you have to have witnesses and a notary. Um, 
watching the signatures, there are certain protective requirements that have to be done to make a will valid. And uh, that's what lawyers are pretty good at, general lawyers. Now, what about the trust? What is this word trust? And what, how do we take it apart so it doesn't have this, this, like, this, this concept of, I have no idea what a trust is. It's new to me. It's just a new word. I've heard it, but I'm not sure how it works. Here's how it works. In the wills that I do, well, let's take an older will. An older will would say, uh, my name is Jim Jones. I'm of sound mind and body. I appoint my wife or my brother as the executor, and I leave all my possessions to my loved ones as follows. And they lay it all out. And there's the signature and the notaries, and that's it. Now, my will would say, I'm Jim Jones, I appoint so-and-so as an executor, and at the same time as the creation of my will, I'm creating the Jim Jones Revocable Trust. And all of my valuable assets go into that trust upon the execution of this will. Now, could the trust just be done by itself? Probably. But the way I like to do it is I do the will, but instead of the will dispersing the assets, the will is simply identifying the trust, giving the, the credibility of the will and the longstanding relationship of the will by the court system. It's saying, I am making this trust. So it's like a double support, that the will says it and the trust says it. And so what happens is, and I don't want to lose you on this one, it's, it's a legal fiction. Nothing changes. So I'm going to look at you, sir. Right now, the assets that you own belong to you and your wife as husband and wife. Is it correct? Okay. So what we're going to do when we do your will and trust, you're going to end up as individuals owning nothing. As husband and wife, as the trustees of your trust, you own everything in that trust. Everything switches to the trust. So there's nothing to go to probate about. You as an individual no longer own those assets. You own them in your trust, which you are the creator of your trust. And while you're alive, you are the trustee. It's the exact same thing, except for a legal fiction. You don't have to get a tax ID number. You don't have to change the way you do accounting or file your tax returns. It's business as usual. The simple concept is if you go to probate court and you get a judge's order, that's the key for your executor to access your assets. That piece of paper with a trust with all the assets now owned by the trust, that valid, validly executed trust has the same legal standing as the probate order from the judge. Except you don't have to go to probate court with the trust. It's already done. Now, people are saying, is, is that really true? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the cost of the trust is probably going to be less expensive and a lot less stressful for your loved ones than the probate court. The trust happens automatically upon the passing of the loved one. Now let's say it's a husband and wife in a practical situation. The husband and wife are co-creators and co-trustees. So if God forbid one of the spouses passes, the survivor inherits everything. They have the same authority and control as the two of you did. Everything goes, let's say the husband, I say God forbid, the husband passes, the wife survives, she is now the sole trustee of that trust. Everything is for her, her benefit. Now, when she passes, then it goes to the beneficiaries, the children, the grandchildren, the nieces, the nephews, charities, whatever you wish. 
The same way you would have done it in the will, except this way we avoid the probate and we do it all ahead of time in a very comfortable environment. So in a very simple way, that is what we're talking about here. We're talking about a legal opportunity that allows families to skip a very stressful, older paradigm of probate court and have a modern estate with a will and a trust that you spend time with me. And part of what I'd like to do is you don't just come into the office and give me some information and I go, here are all your documents, good luck. I like to do it that within the, the process of working with people, I build in a mini seminar. So just like this, edu this lecture is, is a knowledge lecture, I mean, I'm giving you information that you can understand and, and digest. When you work with me, I explain to people why we're doing it this way and why, what are some of your questions? And there's, there's typically about 100 questions that could come up. But I've, I've, let's just say over the 100 estates that I've done. Well, I'm used to giving people examples, explaining why we might do it this way, giving you food for thought. So, you know, you're not having to, re to start from scratch and reinvent the wheel. It's not that hard for me. And it, it, it ends up, in my experience, that when people are finished the process, there's a very good feeling. It's like checking off one of the bucket lists. I, you know, it's, I feel good about it. So we've talked about the paradigm change, the wills, the, the history of wills. We've talked about the trust, that it's, it's very, very simple. Um, the trust is a modern day will but we, without the probate. Now, the question that comes up a lot is, I've heard this concept of a revocable trust and an irrevocable trust. What is that all about? Well, while you're alive, the trust is revocable. What, by revocable, what it means is you can change it anytime you want. It's your trust. So you're, you created it and you're the trustees. So you can do whatever you want, theoretically. You could change it every month if you wanted to pay the fees. When the second spouse passes, it becomes irrevocable, meaning that however the, the two of you wanted things to be, once you're not here to change it, nobody else can change it. It's locked in stone. But while you're alive, you can change it why would you change it? Well, you won the lottery. You've got more friends to give money to. You decided to uh, change who your successor trustees are because the little kids grew up and now you can trust the, the son that was 10 or 20. Now he's 40. I think he's mature enough. And so there could be an amendment here and there. But generally speaking, I try to do it that these documents should last a lifetime, barring some unforeseen situation. Now, I'm gonna get a little bit more involved here. In the old wills and, and in some trusts, people or lawyers and their clients would attempt to list all the assets in the will, like everything you own. Like there would be an exhibit. We own this house and this farm and this car, and we have an account with Merrill Lynch or Edward Jones, and you know, and there's a list. Well, that was very common. What's the problem with that? Well, go forward five years, and I guarantee you that asset list will change. So what does that mean? Well, you have to go back to the lawyer and amend the list. Otherwise, if it's not on that list and you have new assets, the court may not know what to do with it because you haven't specified that that asset was in the will. Now, in the trust, it's a similar thing. You could, in the older trusts, come in and have an exhibit to the trust where you try to list everything you own. I don't do it that way. What I do in the modern trusts and wills 
is simply say that this trust includes all the valuable assets of these two parties, including but not limited to the following, cash, real estate, businesses, investments, retirement accounts, gold, silver, royalties, intellectual property, cars, boats, etc. And that's adequate. In other words, everything of value that you own by legal definition is part of that trust without you having to list every single, every single item specifically. So what does that mean? That means you can buy and sell things, years can go by, you sell the farm, you buy a house in town, it's already covered. We don't have to go back and start changing the exhibits and making this thing more complicated. And there is a tendency as people get older that they tend to consolidate assets and have things a little bit more organized as you get to your retirement years. You don't want so many things spinning around. So all of this is covered. So suddenly we have a situation where the will empowers a trust. The trust is changeable during your lifetime, any way you want. We don't list all the assets in an itemized way. We just say all assets with examples. And so you can buy and sell and change things and have all kinds of things, make more money, make less money, and it's all okay. Is this true? Absolutely. Is it as simple as I'm saying? Yes, it is. Are you hearing this from other people? No. No. If you walk into a lawyer's office and you ask for a will, in most cases, not all, in most cases, not all lawyers have been trained in trusts and estate planning. And they might just offer you a will. It's worked for hundreds of years. I mean, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. It just isn't what I would recommend for you. So if you do end up going to someone other than myself, make sure you have this discussion of wills and trusts and what it's gonna cost. And will there be a, an educational component that you understand all this? And it's simple, it should be very simple. Now, I'm gonna take a, a leap here and give you one added fact that I think it's important for you to understand. In the trust, I said, that we're gonna list examples of all the assets so that if they change, they're all covered. That's true. However, there are five categories of assets that you have to do one more step. And I'm gonna tell you what they are right now so that you're not ever left in a situation without knowing. Real estate has to be put in the name of a trust. So if you and your wife own your home, the deed says both of you, you own your home as husband and wife. Once the trust is created, we're gonna go back and change the deed to say that your revocable trust owns the house. We need to do that extra step to make sure the real estate is not pulled into a probate. So real estate, bank accounts. You're gonna just change your checking account and your bank account to the name of the trust instead of your name. The banks are used to this. When you call them up, they'll say, fill out this form, give us a copy of the trust. They do this all day long, you just don't know it. The third category is investments. If you have an investment account, at, let's say Edward Jones, you're gonna call Edward Jones up and just say, I just did a trust with my lawyer. Okay, we'll change the, the name of your investment account to the revocable trust. It's a piece of paper and so far there's no cost. The real estate, there's a, there's a cost. We have to refile the deed and typically it's gonna be about $150 to redo the deed, refile your homestead exemption and a couple other little things. But it's only one time. Now if you own 10 pieces of real estate then maybe we'll negotiate a discount with the, you know, but. We, there's certain costs to just do that, but it protects the real estate from going into probate. The fourth category are businesses. How many people here own a business of their own? 
Okay, so here's how that works. Generically, in the trust, I said businesses was one of those classes. But to be sure it doesn't go into probate, I will make an exhibit that I attach to the trust that simply gives a one paragraph explanation of that business. The XYZ Corporation, the stock is owned by Jim Jones. It, it's a, it's a con, it, it does, it manufactures auto parts in Jefferson County. You know, a little descriptive paragraph added to the trust is sufficient to keep that business from going into probate. So instead of just saying businesses is a generic category, I need to do a little bit more. Now what happens in five years if that business is gone, you've sold it, it doesn't matter. You don't, we don't have to go back and change the trust, it's just not there. So that's four categories, is that correct? Real estate, banking, checking and savings accounts, investment accounts, and businesses. The fifth category is, is in your favor. It's retirement accounts and insurance. The good news there is that if you have a, a, a traditional IRA or 401k, the courts respect that. And as you may know, for those of you that have done this, when you take out the insurance or you take out the retirement account, you set it up, you have to file a beneficiary statement. In other words, if something happens to me, who gets this money? That beneficiary statement is respected by both the probate court and the general public, and that money would go to that beneficiary irrespective of probate. The probate court won't touch it. Now, me being a suspicious person, I go, okay, and I mention in the generic list of assets, um, retirement accounts and insurance, but I also, I, I want it there, even though they're typically exempt as of today, well, who knows about next week, next month, and five years. So I'm including in that generic listing insurance and retirement accounts just to put a little extra protection there. So there are the five special categories, everything else by just a generic listing will, will be in the trust. Now, as a little levity and uh, add some levity to the question, to the situation, I say to people, or they say to me, well, David, if that's true, why on the, on the intake form that you give me, you ask me for a list of assets? Not the account number, just what, what, tell me what I'm working with here. And I go, well, I'm concerned that you might have what I call an exotic asset that may, by somebody's definition, not fit that definition of cash, real estate, cars. It could be something that is so unusual that I should know about it just to be certain. And they go, well, like an example. I say an example, you own a zoo in South Africa. Oh. Well, I don't own a zoo, I understand. But do you have something that's just not in the norm? And you would be surprised at some of the things that people tell me that had I not asked, <laughs> I, you know, hear about it later, you go, wow. So in an exotic asset, which is just a word, it's not like that exotic, I'll, sp I'll mention those items specifically, just to be safe. A zoo in South Africa will be in that list of assets, just so that somebody doesn't make an argument, well, that's not a regular asset. So I, I like to be comprehensive about it. But other than these exceptions, all of the assets are included in the estate and are automatically transferred, avoiding probate 100%, avoiding the probate fees, the six to 12 months in court, the stress, the public nature of it, the anguish at a time when a family is most vulnerable. And that's really what this is about. And by the way, you typically save money and all kinds of time and aggravation for your loved ones. Now at this point, before I go into the medical documents, well, actually, I think what we're gonna do, we're gonna do questions and answers at the end, and we're gonna go off camera. 
So I'm going to come back to this uh, questions on wills and trusts. The other component of the, the comprehensive planning are documents called a, a living will, a, a medical power of attorney and living will. Some of you probably already have this or something similar. It's certainly growing in uh, popularity. And here's what that document is essentially saying. It could be husband and wife, or it could be a single person who, who chooses a dear friend, a, a family member to be their medical advocate. But let's say in one situation, you're, you're going into the hospital to have, let's say a minor surgery, but you're gonna be under anesthesia for let's say a few hours and not able to speak for yourself. But you're expected to be okay. During that time, this document chooses a medical advocate for you that you've chosen. In a husband and wife situation, typically it's each other. But I also say, well, let's assume the spouse for some reason is not available, so let's have an alternate just to be safe. Typically it's your son, your daughter, your brother, your sister, your best friend, somebody that you would feel has your back at that vulnerable moment. And so we do this ahead of time. The second situation would be much more serious, uh, and you, you hear this uh, a lot on, on TV shows and so forth. A person is more at an end of day situation and they're living on um, uh, life support type equipment in a hospital. And the doctors are saying that, you know, uh, they're not gonna ever be the same. This is the end of days for them. The question is, what does that person want? And there's an opportunity in this conversation to put down that some people say, I'd like to be taken off life support if, if that situation is true. I don't wanna be left in that state for an undue amount of time. And your medical advocate who you've designated is there to make sure that, that your wishes are, are honored because you can't speak for yourself. So that's a, it's a serious situation. It's very, very tender. So that's that document. And it's not just that I give you a piece of paper to fill out, we talk about this. What are your wishes? Have you thought about it? Well, I don't wanna think about it. Well, okay, better now than maybe at a time then it's not gonna be uh, available to you. So we do that document. And in that package, there's a few other documents, like there's a HIPAA disclosure, and there's a document that um, if you pass, it, there's a document that gives your advocate the, the right to deal with the funeral parlor. They can have the authority to do all that. So these are all put together in one package. You have your will, your, your revocable trust, your medical powers of attorney, and some associated medical documents. And so the way it works is I, I initially meet with people and I give them intake forms to take home and I get this information from you. And then I would then, upon getting them back, I will draft the documents for your review and tell you to go home and take a red pen and sit down with a cup of tea or coffee and go over them. And if there's anything I got wrong, write it down. I mean, it's not a one shot deal, it's, it's a process. We might go back and forth a little bit until such time that you say to me, yeah, we're, we've talked, this is good. So then we arrange a meeting at my office where you come with two witnesses who are not inheriting, just friends, who watch you sign and I sign as the notary and you now have a full set of modern comprehensive legal estate documents. Old wills are destroyed if you had an old trust that didn't do what I just said, we destroy it. Um, and I ask you to put these documents in a safety deposit box. And we have a discussion about talking to your executor or your successor trustee so that they know what's going on. If it's your son or your daughter or your sister or your whoever, they, they're not magicians. They're not gonna know where these documents are if you don't tell them. So there's some discussion there 
of how this works practically, what they should do, what they should know, and a lot of questions and a lot of answers. The whole process from the first time you start, um, for me, is about five hours of time. For you, the only real big decisions you have to make, who is going to be your successor trustee, and who are you going to leave your assets to? That's, they're the two big questions. The, the other questions are basically informative, just wanting to understand things. All right, now at this point, I've been doing all the talking. So I want to stop the lecture at this point and thank all of you for coming. And we're going to go off camera. And then, of course, we're going to continue with questions and answers for a little bit. And if, if those of you want to, anyone wants to see me afterwards on a private matter, I'll, I'll stick around a little bit. So thank you very much for attending today.